Okay, y'all. So what you're about to hear is probably the most embarrassing episode that I have released. And I've done episodes where I talk about like, you know, diarrhea and vomit and all kinds of stuff. And then <laughs> there's there's one about seeing aliens and stuff. That's some embarrassing stuff. This one might be the most embarrassing. And it's because what you're about to hear is is basically a rant. And I got caught up in, in the emotions of online like commentary and letting it affect me and stuff like that. And I, I kind of, again, like you're going to listen to basically an hour long rant here. But ultimately, I, I decided I'm going to, instead of re-recording this episode in a much more chilled out manner, so where it's not me ranting and raving, um, I decided to leave it because it's still a part of my journey. I mean, I need to learn how to be chilled out and cool. And the fact that I can reflect back on this kind of stuff and, and like, man, that was a misstep. Um, I need to pull back and be more more chilled out and amicable. That's just another sign of me inching along the path of, of growth here. So I want people to, to see and, and feel the path. So, I, so I'm going to leave it up. And the other reason I'm going to leave it up is because it, it, it is actually a really good representation of the mindset that I used to have uh, pre-psychedelics, pre-God. I'm going to be throwing a lot of science at you in this episode, and I'm going to be defending it uh, with a very, uh, you know... <laughs> energetic and, and just ramp, revved up like demeanor. And so if you get caught up in the emotions and, and wrapped around the axle and you, you get really pissed off at what's about to happen and and um, you hear all the science being thrown at you uh, talking about the you know what happened before the Big Bang and you know the arguments of course is that once we get to the area of creation and then the big bang and everything it's kind of all bets are off science at that point at time zero is just as faith-based as any other religion uh in their myth of creation you know so i get it all right i i totally understand that what you're gonna hear is the way i used to think you're also going to hear a lot of very just depressing nihilistic beliefs and again, if you get wrapped up around the axle on that, I mean, I hate to say this, um, but I'm, th that's the intent. Like, my intention is to show you why I needed psychedelics. And then, of course, ultimately why I needed God to pull me out of that nihilism. So again, what, what you're about to hear is a fever-pitched, highly aggressive, uh, John Oliver-style, you know, post-John Stewart and The Daily Show-style rant and rave thing about like, hey, science is great and science is awesome and science has all the answers and science can explain everything in creation and look how smart I am with my science. My thoughts on this have changed immeasurably since my first psychedelic experience and then subsequent God experience. Now, that being said, I haven't fully abandoned all of these thoughts uh, in terms of, you know, quantum mechanics and everything. I, I do believe that there is a trade, you know, a handshake kind of thing of religion, you know, God and science. In fact, I think that God works through science. There seems to be rules that he set up for this universe and he plays by those rules to make things happen. Now, I'm going to save all of that for another episode, but for now, um, just brace yourselves for impact here. Uh, you're going to hear a person who thought that they were insulted and being attacked lashing out. And again, I apologize, but I am going to keep this as is. It does communicate and convey the message, and if it pisses you off, then I hate to say it, but that's kind of the intent. You need to see the raw just nastiness behind uh, being brainwashed by science through and through and the nihilism that results therein and how that completely undermines humanity. So without further ado, I talk too much always. <laughs> Here we go. So I have to admit something right off the bat here before we get started, and that's the, the fact that right now I have, I, I guess you would call it writer's block. And I know that may seem funny because my podcast is basically just me uh, recounting events that happened to me, right? So, like, how am I how am I writing anything? I'm just telling you what happened. Well, the thing is, is I need for this to be compelling, and so there actually is a, a quite a bit of writing that goes into it. I'm not making anything up. I, I'm telling you exactly what happened, but I'm but I'm structuring it in a very uh, emotionally compelling way. 
And that's also why I add music and sound effects is like, I want you to be immersed in what it felt like, even if it's just a tiny modicum of what it felt like, because you could throw out all the words you want and all the music and sound effects that you want. It's only going to account for maybe 0.0001% of what it actually feels like to, uh, to, to have one of these experiences, right? So that, that's where I'm at right now, is that I'm having a hard time trying to get started on... The, the, there's three very weighty topics coming out of Trip 9, which I thought was a very good episode. And the, but there's three things that I kind of had to skim over to, to make the episode flow better and work. If I got too weighed down in these topics, it, the whole episode would be about that. Next thing you know, you look down and the episode is four hours long instead of two hours long. And I don't think... I mean, I don't know, maybe I heard someone say that they like the long uh, format, but I, I've heard more people say that they don't. <laughs> so um, I think overall, it's probably best that I, you know, stay two hours max. And here I am, listen, I'm rambling right now. And so <laughs> let me get to the freaking point here. I'm having a, t- a tough time getting started on these ideas. It's very difficult to come up with a hook that that hooks you right from the from the beginning and then makes it emotionally compelling throughout and i often i will re you know record and re-record entire episodes and throw them away the one i did recently called oh my gosh right now i recorded that one like three different times and that was after i had already scrapped another one that was starting out really really good and it just fell flat and I'll probably release that other one too at some point because it started out really good. But again, like it's really tough to make these episodes and make them emotionally compelling. And so, like I said, I have these three topics that I'm trying to figure out a way to uh, really slam dunk here because I, I refuse to release a subpar episode. And I'm sure some of you are, are like, well, you <laughs> there's that one episode that sucks, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but... But yeah, and that's the problem, right? And so I'm just trying to do too much at, at, at once. I don't know which topic to go on. And then I get sidetracked, honestly. Like I, rec- I recorded a full episode yesterday. Um, I'm talking, spent me all day. And it was an episode basically kind of addressing some comments that I've received on YouTube. I, uh, there's this one um, commenter that has uh, leveled a lot of criticism my way. And some of it, you know, not particularly nice, you know, um, kind of cutting words, you know, and, and I got to get used to this kind of thing if I'm going to, if, if I have any aspirations of making my channel bigger and getting more of a following base, I, I shouldn't be affected by this kind of stuff. But this person's comments was, that they were rooted in a, they echoed a sentiments that I've heard many times and that I've butted heads with people about. Um, people who don't understand why in the world I would take psychedelics. Um, there, there are three classes of people that are detractors. I would say that most of the folks who listen to my podcast and my YouTube channel, uh, if, if we're talking about a bell curve here, the majority of people are supportive and they fall within like that, you know, 80 to 90% kind of part of the bell curve. And then on the fringes of the bell curve, you have the detractors, and you have detractors on both sides of the coin here. You, you have people who are atheist and, and or agnostic and nihilistic who are like who basically have science like crammed so far up their butt that they don't know where, uh, you know, uh, quantum mechanics ends and they begin, which is kind of a funny statement because uh, quantum mechanics governs everything. But uh, then you have the, the people on the other side, uh, the detractors are are religious and they are very offended, like, like very offended that I would take psychedelics and find God. And the, the, their arguments are basically, hey, uh, you don't need psychedelics to find God. Uh, I found God just fine, and I didn't need psychedelics. And the, then there's the, the other group of people. Sometimes they're the same. Sometimes the same people are arguing this, right, is, is that um, it strictly forbids the use of psychedelics in the Bible. Uh, there's, I forget the word, it's like pharmakia or something. Apparently somewhere in the Bible, and I don't know who said it, 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 I don't know if it was God or an angel or Jesus or just a regular person, but it says somewhere that you shouldn't use pharmakia, quote-unquote, 
to have a spiritual experience, it's forbidden. And these same people also start leveling these accusations of, like, it's not angels or God that I've seen, that they are demonic presences masquerading as angels to try to trick me into something. And so it's very... I get this a lot, and people are very irate. Like, they get... If there's one thing I've learned about sharing my experiences with people is when you when you start rolling out God, right, pe- people get very upset on, you know, b- b- like I said, both sides of this bell curve. They get very upset. And I think I, I, I've, I've done some thinking about this, and, and I kind of understand why I think, right? It, it, and to me, it kind of goes like this. It's like, it's just like politics, the stakes are very high when you're talking about politics, right? You're talking about people essentially leaving, uh, living and dying. I mean, everything that we do basically is about survival. And whenever you get into the collective, right, of a lot of humans surviving or dying, um, the stakes are that much higher and people's emotions are a lot more uh, invested and, and people can get very angry. And so uh, politics is one thing. I mean, you, you you start a conversation about politics, it's like get your get get your bulletproof vest ready and your brass knuckles out, you know. Um, but when you start throwing around God, <laughs> now you're talking about uh, damnation, salvation, the very very high stakes, the highest of high stakes, and on both sides, it's like. The uh, atheists and agnostics, they're like, hey, um, th- there is no afterlife, and we just snuff out, and they, uh, I haven't quite figured out why they get so hostile. I-, I need to do a little more thinking on that, but the religious folks, uh, regardless, I- I'm blabbering here, uh, people just get irate, and I'm no different, as <laughs> so do I. Like when so- uh, I'm a newfound believer, and I am but an infant in this uh, spiritual realm, okay? Um, I don't have the maturity to take these things in stride and be like, oh, okay, Uh, they're just, you know, just let this go in in one ear and out the other. They're just let them vent. To me, like, this is a newfound thing. It has saved my life, and I want to defend it. So whenever someone, I mean, basically kind of attacks me, maybe they didn't attack me. Maybe I'm being too sensitive. Again, I'm I'm like a little toddler or an infant in the spiritual realm here. Uh, so maybe they you, you can't really tell uh, through text it, the the tone that someone that someone has. So uh, just about everything that I read that's negative comes to, comes off to me as an attack. And so that's a problem with me actually. Um, and so regardless, I had this emotional response to this person. basically it's like I don't understand. Uh, why you would take psychedelics um, to understand that God is real. And th- there was another comment of like, hey, don't do drugs. <laughs> I was trying to give a recommendation to somebody about, you know, they, they reached out to me in, in earnestness and said, hey, I'm about to do my first kind of um, ayahuasca experience. What do you, do you have any recommendations? And I released a, a video talking about my recommendations and the response from this person is like, don't do drugs. <laughs> hey kids, don't do drugs, which, which I think was a line from, uh, the water boy, uh, Lawrence Taylor's kind of like making fun of the water. So again, I, I perceive this as an attack. And so, um, and again, if you're not trying to attack me, then cool. Uh, but if you are, I I can just tell you that I released an entire I wasted an entire day yesterday <laughs> releasing a video uh, explaining why, and I realized that I'm now like ten minutes into talking about this, so I'm wasting more time. But I would like to at the beginning of this podcast here talk about that briefly because I did a whole video on it and. It started to get stagnant and stale when I got into quantum mechanics and talking about, you know, um, cosmic nucleation and quantum tunneling, a zero mass, uh, you know, zero mass universe, quantum tunneling, and then, uh, you know, inflation theory taking over from there and the negative potential energy stored in the gravity, you know, field, injecting the rest of the energy into the universe. So I was asked, you know, what, what, what I, if I didn't believe in God, how did I think creation happened. And 
I mean, it, it, it's hard for me to start even to, t- to talk about that. It's, it's, be, it's as if the people out there have never heard of atheists before or agnostics. And, and, and they've never thought that an atheist or an ad- agnostic can be as smart as they are. Uh, and, and so the, the, the crazy thing though, that you'll find out, because I, I'm going to spare you the whole, the uh, hour long discussion of nuclear, uh, you know, uh, cosmic nucleation and this quantum tunneling effect that where you can basically create a universe from nothing and in the infinite probability of, um, you know, nothingness, it, which according to quantum mechanics is still a, a kind of like a, a quantum state, right? If you have zero time, that basically is the same thing as saying that you have infinite time. So before there was anything, there was nothing, not even time. And if there's no time, that means that there's infinite time. It's a, it's a weird paradox. In an infinite amount of time in a quantum state, anything and everything will happen. And so, uh, and, and by the way, there is, there's mathematics about this. There's, uh, quantum mechanics is, is not just some Looney Tunes idea that I just came up with. It is a, it is the most successful theory ever posited by humans in the history of the human race. It has been, uh, tested and experimented and validated experimentally uh, for uh, for about a hundred years, um, if I remember correctly, the the first um, in fact the, the the first double slit experiment uh, w- was c- conceived the, like thought of like two hundred years ago, over two hundred years ago, and and so we've been proving this theory correct ever since. And if you if you don't believe, I'm going to spare you the whole quantum mechanics uh, lecture because it gets very dry. And no one wants to hear that. There's plenty of stuff on YouTube. Go look it up if you're interested. If you're not interested, fine. But you should be because it's describing the nature of reality. Straight up. Everything is governed by quantum mechanics. Everything. Period. All of science, all of matter, all of energy, the entire universe is governed by quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics, as strange as it is, because it's very strange... And as much as you deny it, it is real, and it governs everything. And if you disagree, well, then you disagree that you are listening to me on your phone or on your computer, or that I'm even talking into a microphone, or that you turned on a light switch earlier today because everything that I just mentioned, or or even uh, used your global positioning system like Google Maps or something like that, all of these things that I just mentioned, at their very core, rely on quantum mechanics to function. The people who invented all of these devices, they had to bake quantum mechanics into their equations and into the mechanics of what's, of how these things work to get them to work. And so if that is real, if quantum mechanics is real as it is, then there, it calls for some kind of explanation, like using quantum mechanics to figure out how this universe came into existence in the first place. And I can tell you that they're for sure is a quantum mechanics solution for how a universe can basically spring forth from nothingness. And if if you want to yell at me and say that's ridiculous, all I got to say is I can look at you and say that it's just as ridiculous to to posit that an all-powerful being like spoke the universe into existence. To me, um, now, granted, I'm a God guy now, so I I believe that, that God did both. I believe that he spoke... Uh, something into existence and what he spoke into existence was quantum mechanics. <laughs> okay. And the, and the rest is history. Um, well, I mean, he, he spoke a lot more than that as I'll talk about in, in trip number 10. But one of the things that he spake was quantum mechanics, but regardless as a scientist, and, and by the way, there's thousands upon thousands, if not millions of people who subscribe to this, um, this theory of, of how the universe sprang, uh, universe sprang forth from a quantum fluctuation. You needn't God in the equation to pull this off. God never enters into the picture at all. And a quantum physicist is perfectly okay with that. 
And again, I, I could get into all the details about the quantum fluctuation that started, you know, the cosmic nucleation and then the inflaton field, you know, and, uh, cosmic inflation, and then how gener general relativity takes over from there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I'll spare you that. Just know that I spent, uh, gosh, you know, 25 plus years investigating this. I have books uh, upon books upon books about this matter. The very first book I ever read was a 500 page book about super string theory where it covered all of this. And I know I'm just screaming into the void here because someone who's very religious can just be like, no, it says this in the Bible. Like, why can't you get it through your head that it says it in the Bible? It's true, period. And again, I could come through and say, well, why can't you get it through your head that on the scientific side of the equation here, we have the scientific method. We have uh, hundreds and thousands of people that are hypothesizing and then testing and experimenting what they just have hypothesized and then revising what their hypothesis was based on their results. And it's being peer reviewed and other people are running the same experiments and maybe tweaking it a little bit so that they can get better results. And then they everything goes back and refines your theory. And the next thing you know, you have the Large Hadron Collider and we're smashing atoms together at um, n near the speed of light to uh, mimic the, the temperatures and pressures that were prevalent in the early universe so that we can probe deeper into the uh, subatomic particle and, and try to probe out and coax out these particles that only existed for maybe a trillionth of a second at the time of, bi of the Big Bang, but are going to be instrumental in understanding uh, as we get closer and closer to time zero what actually happened, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's like, don't come to me and say, that I did not need psychedelics to find God. Do not go there. When I tell you that I did not believe in the fella, in God, and that I had explanations as to why the universe could spring into existence without God, and that that theory is supported by more PhDs across a hundred years that you can shake a stick at, and when I tell you that uh, being so immersed in science like that can turn you into a nihilist where you don't believe that anything is special, like humans don't have souls, that, uh, you know, if there is no God, then therefore humans don't have souls. And if humans don't have souls, then we're just a collection of atoms that is no difference, no different than I'm just picking up something random on my desk. There's a lens cap here. We're no different than this freaking lens cap. The only difference between us and this damn lens cap is that w w there's enough atoms in us to form uh, neurons and this confluence of uh, trillions of synaptic uh, connections in our brain from these neurons uh, through emergence gives rise to consciousness. And that is the only difference <laughs> in terms of we're just a collection of atoms between me and this lens cap right here, is that I have enough atoms and, and enough complexity within those atoms to form some synaptic connections to where there is electrochemical communication going on between all these synapses and through emergence I can now uh, contemplate you know you know become conscious and understand my own mortality that is the only difference if we're talking about this from a nihilistic point of view and when you think of people being uh, not as important as a lens cap or we, we'll take this even even lower, because I just pulled something off my desk. Take the worst scum on the planet. Just just take, just go out to a pond and find a bunch of pond scum. Um, may, maybe there's a, a dead and bloated, uh, you know, I don't know, a possum in, in, in the pond. And you, you scrape around all the rot and all the bacteria and all the freaking algae. And you scope, scoop that out of the pond and throw that down on the ground. And I'm telling you... That back before I believed in God, I did not think that any human on the planet was any better than that rotten pond scum that you just pulled out of the pond. And not just individual humans. I'm talking about all of humanity, every single human on the planet right now. But even further, every, every single human that ever existed on the planet or, or will ever exist into the future no better than pond scum straight up that's what i used to think
And with space being practically infinite, I mean, for all we know, it is infinite. But, but, I mean, you just look at the observable universe right now. And I say right now because the universe is still expanding from the initial uh, conditions at the Big Bang. Big Bang happens, big explosion, and, and space itself expands. And it's still expanding. In fact, it's accelerating. And scientists don't know exactly why yet. That it's called dark energy. There's a theory about it. I, I, I'm, I don't want to get into the theory. But we're talking 94 billion light years, y'all. So uh, the, the the speed of light, it's 186,000 miles per second. Okay? Even at that immense, mind-numbingly crazy speed, it would still take a beam of light at 186,000 miles per second. It would take that beam of light... 94 billion years to go from one side of our particle horizon, which is the edge of our observable universe, the edge of causality that we know it, by the way, it would it would take it 94 billion years to get from one side to the other. That's huge. I don't know if you if, if you realize how huge that is, but but it's pretty huge. And that's just the edges of our particle horizon. That, that's as far that uh, with the expansion of space uh, and the speed of light and causality included, that's as far as light has gone, even factoring in the expansion of space. And within this 94 billion light year sphere that encompasses the observable universe, there is something on the order of, uh, I think it's something like 300 billion galaxies in there. Sorry, I just paused and looked that up. It's about 100 billion right now, but it's likely to increase to 200 billion as telescope technology in space improves. And if you want to get an idea of how big of a number that is, uh, take a large beach somewhere uh, uh, on the on the planet and imagine counting every single grain of sand on that beach. And that kind of comes close to uh, how big of a number three, uh, 200 billion is. But that's not even the trippy part. When you start talking about the number of stars in the observable universe, the number is staggering. I'm just going to throw this ridiculous number out at you real quick. 200 sextillion. And to put it another way, that is 200 billion trillion. Think of it this way. That's a trillion 200 billion times. So uh, I, I know this is like kicking a dead horse here, but... Count to a trillion, and then repeat that 200 billion times. And y'all, that's just stars, okay? Each star has at least one planet, and some have like upwards of like 20 or 30 or some crazy amount like that. We have nine. Sorry, eight. Uh, Pluto's no longer a planet. But you can get the you get the idea of, uh, I mean, if there's at least one star, like one to even like Maybe let's max it out at eight, okay? If there's one to eight planets for every star in the observable universe, uh, scientists have done this calculation. It's not very exact, but it's close enough, I guess. The number there, y'all, there are one trillion trillion planets in the observable universe. And again, what that means is count to a trillion, which, by the way, is like counting to a million a million times. So do that, and then do that a trillion times. To sit there and think that Earth, this tiny little backwater just blob of mush flying around through space, is anything special in this equation is laughably ridiculous. Especially when you factor in that, for all we know, the particle horizon, you know, the observable universe is not the boundary of the universe. There's likely more universe beyond that. In fact, there likely could be an infinite amount of more universe out there, which means there's an infinite amount of planets and stars and galaxies and so forth. And and we will never know unless we can invent some kind of friggin' warp, warp drive or something that can just instantly zap us over to the other side of the universe and then more of the universe opens up. We have a new particle horizon right there in that little spacecraft that... Now, you know, et cetera, et cetera. This could be an infinite universe that we're living in, is all I'm saying. And even crazier than that, y'all, that that is just space. We haven't even started talking about time yet. T- to make this simple, I'm going to kind of uh, fudge some numbers here. The universe has existed for about 13, I think it's like 13.5 billion years, 
we're going to round that to 10 billion. Given a few parameters like star formation, uh, the projected amount of white dwarfs and black holes left after the fact, uh, black hole evaporation, proton decay, etc., etc., cosmologists and astronomers estimate that the universe will essentially uh, cease to exist in roughly 10 to the power, let's see, what's this number I'm looking at here, 10 to the power of 200 years into the future. And, you know, I just kind of just blurted out that number, right? Uh, to, to put that astronomically huge number into perspective, let's th- th- think of this. Okay, so remember the huge numbers that I was throwing across at you earlier about the number of galaxies and stars and planets? You know, uh, those are huge numbers, right? So take all of those stars, all those planets, and let's throw other stuff in there too, like all of the comets and, and asteroids, all of the cosmic gas and dust, you know, like the nebulae and everything. And imagine how many single atoms... Are you know exist that 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 comprise all of that everything in the in the entire observable universe? That's that's a staggering huge number, right? Well, the estimate uh, to that to the amount of atoms in the observable universe is ten to the power of seventy eight. Y'all, that's less than half of the number of years remaining in the entire universe until it ends. Essentially, when I say that we are a blip on a blip on a blip on a blip. Uh, it, but but losing hope when faced with such immensity is easy. I mean, we're, we're talking about the freaking cosmos. So l- let's step a few steps back. In fact, a lot of steps back, and let's take this closer to home. All right, let's talk. Let's talk about you. Okay, so the average life expectancy of a person alive on the planet today. Um, I just looked this up. It's it's seventy three years roughly. Okay, so in seventy three years of you being alive. The likelihood that you will accomplish or do anything of note that will immortalize your name and memory, it's it's slim to none, okay? And when I say that, like, like think about, like, folks like Julius Caesar, okay? <laughs> that freaking guy existed 2,000 years ago, and, and everyone, it's like a common household name. Uh, think of, like, Joan of Arc. Think of uh, Abraham Lincoln, Malcolm X, Cher, uh, Joe Exotic. <laughs> okay, that, that, those last two uh, were jokes there, but but you get the idea. Being on this level is virtually unattainable in life. The best you can hope for is, is that you make enough of an, of an impression to be remembered by, like, maybe two generations of your own family. I, I, I mean, heck, y'all, I, I can't tell you anyone from three gener- uh, generations ago in my family. Anybody. And, and I'm sad to say this. I know we're all supposed to be optimistic and, like, go out and grind and all this stuff, right? But that's just the way it will it will play out, Period. But even if you did reach the level of a Julius Caesar or an Abraham Lincoln or whatever, the facts are, it's, it's very clean and cut here. Our sun is a G-type yellow dwarf main sequence star, okay? That means that in about 5 billion years or so, give or take, when, when the sun runs out of hydrogen fuel to fuse, it will start fusing helium into lithium. And this will cause pressures and stuff to change in the sun, and the sun will swell to such a large size that it will engulf the whole orbit of the planet Earth. Okay? The freaking Earth will be consumed by and melt into the sun. Now, what does that mean? That means that everything, every city or monument, I I talked about Julius Caesar earlier, right? Uh, uh, Ancient Rome was one of the most amazing uh, civilizations ever. All of that melted into the sun it will become plasma the the united states of america with all of its awesomeness right it, it melted into the sun uh, every amazing piece of art that we have all of our religious literature uh, any remnant of anything about you or anyone else's life will just be flat out gone okay none of this matters we do not matter y'all th- that's how little i cared about humankind and when I looked around at all the you know killing and violence and rape and rage and hysteria and angst and racism and sexism, et cetera, et cetera, I, was, I, I thought to myself, you know, we are lower than that pond scum that I mentioned earlier. Because pond scum is just doing what pond scum does, being pond scum. <laughs> all right, humans... We understand pain, and we understand that others feel pain, and yet we still engage in behavior that inflicts this pain on others. Pond scum doesn't have this capacity. Pond scum is therefore more virtuous than humans, and therefore better off without us, without humans. 
and, and this and this next part may sound very familiar to you if you go and listen to uh, the the no joke episode. I don't want anyone to die or anything like that. But everything, including pond scum, would be much better off if there were no humans on the planet. Remember that? I do. That was one of the most pivotal moments of my life, y'all. When I saw, I was sitting there recording an episode, much like I'm doing now, espousing these same thoughts to you. Uh, and I sat there and I was trying to give you a, a, a semblance into my logic that I had at the time as a friggin' hopeless nihilist. And I'm sitting there trying to d- defend my own logic that I had back in those days. And I came across the thought of half of the people on the planet should be wiped out. Four billion people dead. Remember we were talking about astronomical numbers, right? I kept throwing around those numbers, uh, 85 million people dead in World War II. Four billion people dead, y'all, is like fighting World War II and all the 85 million people that died therein for, uh, over the entire human struggle, fighting World War II 47 times consecutively. So you, you finish the whole war, and then you start it all over again. All of the Holocaust and, and the Jews being gassed to death, men, women, children, uh, all of the, the atrocities with uh, Japan and China. And I'm not saying that America didn't you know, do our own atrocities. I mean, shit, we dropped a friggin' nuclear bomb, two nuclear bombs. Okay? People instantly vaporized, y'all. Um, so, so fight World War II again, and then fight it again, and then again, and then again, 47 times. And I said this in that particular episode, and I'm going to say it again. I guarantee you Adolf Hitler and Heydrich Himmler both were like, hey, I don't want people to die, but we got to rid ourselves of this Jew problem. Well, let's kill, let's kill them humanely. They shouldn't be made to suffer, but nonetheless, let's kill them. I don't want them to die, but it has to be done. Y'all, when I say that I needed psychedelics to save me from myself, to save me from nihilism so that I can believe in something again, you had better respect and appreciate that. And when I say that the only way that I would have found God was through psychedelics, you had better respect and appreciate that too. And when I say that finding God has saved me in practically every manner imaginable, again, respect and appreciate that, please. (sighs) Okay, there it is. I let it out. And and, and I'm sorry, everybody, (laughs) that I got so enraged there, and I was basically yelling (laughs) just now. I'm sorry. I'm kind of, in a way, yelling at my old self. Okay, there... These people who have commented on my YouTube channel and stuff, I mean, it's not them either, right? I've encountered people, you know, outside of my podcast in in just regular life, you know, who have done the same thing. And again, like, I'm an infant in this whole spiritual realm. I take things personally. I I get in these people's faces. I'm I'm working on it. I'm trying to get better to where I don't erupt, y'all, but... It's a very uh, passionate thing for me. It, it's the most important thing that has ever happened to me in my entire life. Ever. The, the, the next highest thing, uh, amazing thing that has happened in my life doesn't even come close, y'all. It doesn't. We were talking about the size of the observable universe, right? 94 billion light years. The next best thing that has happened to me in my life isn't even in the same observable. We're talking 94 billion light years below, below that event, taking psychedelics and finding God. Okay. So it's a little insulting when you take something that amazing and that transformative and, and rips you out of hell and gives you hope again, that someone will come along and insult that and shit all over it. And this is also directed at, I mean, one of my goals here, and I don't even know if it's a good goal to have, because I'm going to basically blacklist myself for life <laughs> uh, if I get fully behind this this channel, right? It's like my name will be forever associated with psychedelics, henceforth. And even though I don't want to ever really go back to my corporate uh, existence that I had before this, because it was absolutely miserable and I hated every freaking second of it, if by some reason I needed to go back, the, the, the people are going to find this channel. 
and it's going to be like, hey, uh, what did you do for uh, you, you quit uh, your your 15 year career because of what? <laughs> Y'all, when I I have a lot of stake here. Well, the, well, I'm losing my train of thought here. What I'm getting at here, y'all, is that I've blacklisted myself. And I'm going to also, again, I want to get this message out to people because I think it's very important. Otherwise, I wouldn't be doing this this podcast. I, I found God through an unconventional means. By the way, this unconventional means is, is going to become conventional very soon. Uh, modern day psychiatry and psychology are paying very close attention to the efficacy of psychedelics and their, um, you know, therapeutic usage to cure crippling addictions, y'all, and, and crippling depression and so on and so forth. They're taking it seriously. I guarantee you in five to 10 years, it's going to be a very commonplace house. Uh, I almost said household, probably not household, but it'll be a very commonplace thing in medicine. So fire all your cannons at me right now if you want, but in five to 10 years, give or take, it's going to be common. But regardless, in the interim, I have to put up with, you know, being blacklisted and people hating me. <laughs> and uh, I, I guarantee you, if this becomes successful, I, I'm hiding it right now from uh, certain family members and certain friends because I fear if they find out that I've done psychedelics, even though I've done it legally, that they are going to blow a gasket and be like, we're never talking to Andrew ever again, <laughs> you know? Um, so the, the, this is another reason why I'm taking 40 minutes <laughs> at, at the beginning of this episode. This was supposed to only be like a, maybe a 10 minute discussion about this, but I turned it into like a 40 minute diatribe here and I apologize, but I really want to ha- have something that I can hand to somebody and say, this is why I took psychedelics and, and hopefully they will understand. And if they don't, I don't know what to say. Um, Come over here and arrest me or come hit me with a Bible, because that's another thing that I wanted to address and I kind of forgot to. I I addressed that first category of uh, people who were detractors, right? The ones that said, well, you don't need to um, have or take psychedelics to have a God experience or to find God. Well, I did. And hopefully I just proved to you that I did need it. But then there's the other group of people that are like, well, it strictly forbids uh, the use of any kind of drug or whatever, any kind of multi- mind-altering substance, pharmakia or whatever they call it. Uh, they, they strictly forbid that usage in the Bible uh, to, to have a spiritual experience. And then these people further go on to say that um, because it strictly forbids it, that what I saw couldn't possibly be God or angels, and that it's likely uh, some demonic uh, force or presence or being or whatever you want to call it, that is deceiving me. Like they're masquerading as angels and they're deceiving me. Well, uh, I have uh, a few really easy arguments to dismantle that theory. Number one, nothing in my entire journey so far has any, any of the takeaways that I've had on my experience, uh, my psychedelic trips have been negative. Sure. I've been dropped into hell a few times, but that was a tough love lesson that I needed to have. And God saved me just about every time. There was one time that I saved myself, and it was amazing because God told me, hey, what have I taught you? And so I was able to rescue myself. It was a beautiful and empowering thing. But regardless, what I'm trying to get at here is even though I've had absolutely hellish experiences on my trips, at the end of that has always been a beautiful, unbelievably awesome life lesson. I have received no life lessons or advice or, uh, you know, revelations or whatever you want to call them in all of my trips that you can construe as dangerous, period. It's been honestly nothing but very biblical stuff, like mind-blowingly biblical in, in, the, in the sense that I wasn't a biblical scholar at all. I mean, I was familiar with the basics. I mean, everyone hears about the Adam and Eve story and the Jonah and the whale and, you know, you know Noah's Ark and everything. I knew the basics and I knew some stuff about Jesus, but yo, I thought all of that was a joke. (laughs) I mean, and Jesus was the biggest joke of them all back, back, you know, for me back then. Right. I didn't freaking care about, especially uh, read the Bible. Okay. And yet most of everything that has come out of my trips has been highly biblical, biblical in nature. I I mean, y'all, I I met with a, basically a Catholic nun twice now. I mean, my last meeting with with her was last week. 
And she is absolutely blown away. First of all, she believes that I definitely encountered God. This is a woman who has like three uh, degrees in theology and, you know, of course, has done all the whole Catholic uh, thing. And all you, you know, Lutherans out there, uh, say what you want about uh, Catholics, okay? We're all on the same team here, okay? So let's just chill out for a second, okay? But, But she is utterly convinced that I saw God or something godly, like either God or an angel. And she is absolutely blown away at my just overnight, basically overnight, uh, deep knowledge and understanding of biblical concepts. And I understand the, the this whole concept. And now that I am reading the Bible, <laughs> I, I I know the this whole concept that uh, apparently Satan uh, knew more scripture than anything or whatever. Like he knows his scripture. Uh, so it. So still, people could sit back and be like, well, this is still demons masquerading as angels or God or whatever that are tricking you with their knowledge of Scripture and whatnot. And all I got to say to that is no, because these same demons, how, how are they giving me signs of the cross? How are they showing me uh, visions of Jesus in my shower that I have a picture of? <laughs> Uh, aren't these, uh, the, 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 there is one thing that I, another thing that I picked up in actual, actually reading the Bible is that apparently these demons and stuff are supposed to be absolutely terrified and mortified and run in absolute terror from the very mention of Jesus Christ and a crucifix and much less a vision <laughs> of him. Now, why would a demon do that? I'm just going to sit back and let you think about that for a second. So, so hopefully I can dispense with it, with that whole freaking argument too. Okay. And the last argument that I want to kind of dispense with before we move on here is why did I keep doing psychedelics? Okay. So the trip number two, uh, that that's the first time that I encountered God. Why would I continue further? Like if, if God shows himself and it's like, Hey, I'm real here. I am. I'm real. Why would I need to continue any further? Why not just pick up a Bible and start reading, right? Well, very simple answer to that. God showed up, right? I didn't say which God. I don't know if you knew if you knew this, but there there are other religions out there, right? And and not just Christian religions, okay? There are non-Christian religions out there. What I saw was a God. Now, what God it was, which religious sect. I mean, in my opinion, God doesn't have a religion because religion is something made up by, by humans, but God doesn't have a religion. And what I saw, I didn't automatically identify as the God of Abraham. Okay. The Christian Jew, Muslim God, by the way, uh, I want you to also really think about that. That God belongs to it. it, it those three uh, religions right there. <laughs> so, I didn't know what I was looking at was the God of Abraham. Okay, that came later. And I had to go on subsequent experiences to uh, unearth that and find that out. Furthermore, uh, I'm almost 30 years into this whole nihilism thing, right? Just one little quick little vision uh, or feeling of God is not enough, honestly. I mean, I was blown away in the moment and uh, for about three or four days afterwards. But by about the fifth day, I started questioning this. It's like you you can't recall and, and re-feel the same magic that you felt in this experience, right? And it, it gets less impactful the more days are removed. So by about the fifth day, I was kind of like, was that even real? And I was starting to doubt myself, right? And um, I had to go and explore more, y'all, period. I had more, uh, furthermore, I had more questions. The real reason why I got into psychedelics in the first place was not to find God. I don't know how many times I got to say that. It was, I didn't believe in God. I didn't want the answer to be God. Like, I read accounts that, that most, or not most, but a, a significant enough amount of people actually do find God on psychedelics, and that's the thing that fundamentally changes them. But for me, I, I knew better. Like, I knew that God didn't exist, and so that would be a, a, a big litmus test for me right there. It's like, if I, uh, t- uh, bottom line is, I wanted to just experience something that I could not explain away through science, and, and have something to believe a- again. Uh, that that would pull me out of this crippling nihilism. 
And, and I honestly thought I would uh, more than likely encounter the like these kind of Eastern concepts, like, uh, you know, just everything is pure energy and we're all connected and all this other stuff and that reincarnation and all this other stuff. That's the kind of stuff I thought I would in- encounter. Um, and I would have been content with that because th- that can still be explainable, like explained away kind of like through science or whatever. It's kind of like, okay, I get it, right? But uh, finding God, I didn't want that because I knew God didn't exist. And so if, if I'm shown God, I'm like, I'm like, oh, okay, well, this is psychedelic stuff doesn't mean shit. It's a joke. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I authentically didn't hope or want to find him. I did not want to find God. He found me. He, she, it, we, they, whatever you want to call God. It found me. And I am infinitely grateful for that. And you know what? You should be infinitely grateful for that too. Because regardless of how I found him, I found him. Like seriously, the the only way that I can think of condemning someone (laughs) for finding God in a certain way is if the way they found God was something absolutely atrociously messed up. It's like, well, I found God uh, by killing a person. It's like, I killed this person, and then after killing them, God showed up and started talking to me about how consciousness and life is just energy, and energy is, is uh, you know, evenly dispersed throughout the cosmos, and that the, by killing someone, I'm not really destroying any energy. They're moving on, and they have an act. Like, you, you can see... The danger in that, right? If God was telling me that kind of stuff, y'all, like, hey, uh, human lives are still uh, worthless, right? If you kill them, it's just, we're all just energy and we move on. And our energy gets recycled throughout the universe, so there's there's no uh, necessarily any harm in killing someone. If, you know, I can see y'all wanting to step in and... and like warn me that this is dangerous. If, if something like that was communicated to me, it's completely opposite of that. I received nothing but these thoughts of that. We have a, a spark of the divine within us. The, the vision and feeling that I got was that we are all basically tributaries and estuaries of God's love. Like we are a basically subdivided God and if you combine all of those energies into one and, and combine them all just like tributaries and estuaries do into a larger river, and then that river, river becomes an ocean, and that ocean is God. So when you hurt someone, you're hurting God. And you're also hurting yourself. How is that thought dangerous? Please tell me. I defy you. Tell me. Be thankful that I found God. Be infinitely thankful that I found God. And I stress that word infinite, y'all. Because this next trip episode that we're going to get into is going to delve into the infinite. And there are concepts and topics. I mean, I just talked about the, the you know things that could be potentially construed as dangerous. There are topics that we're going to cover uh, that happened and transpired either on the trip or slightly after the trip there are topics in there, y'all, that that kind of fringe on the edges here of what you could construe as dangerous. I mean, there is some serious bone-chilling stuff, and and not only that, uh, that there's a particular um, we we talked about religions, right? There there's a particular religion that gets brought up, and uh, the message behind it is really intense, really intense. And it's going to honestly be probably too much for a good chunk of you to stomach. But I promise you, if you strip away your, uh, gosh, your, your preconceptions, your stereotypes, your bias, and our, our scars are important, right? So take all of your scarring, all of the emotional scars that you've accumulated throughout your life, and also set those aside and approach this topic with an open mind and an open heart. And if your heart and your mind are are pure and unclouded by all that crap, you will see that the message is not only a good one, but is, I hate to throw this out there because I know a lot of you all aren't Christian, it's a very deep and beautiful Christian message. And even if you're not Christian, I hope that you can uh, appreciate it and, and agree that it's what's needed and it's uh, a, a good thing overall. So yeah, uh, I'll leave you in 
on the cliff there, like a little cliffhanger there, uh, in anticipation of what this uh, incredibly deep and crazy concept could be. But trust me, I had to warn you because it's going to hit you like a freaking freight train. So, with that, you know, uh, let me close here by saying that I'm kind of uh, pumping my brakes here with the release of the 10th episode, you know, or sorry, the the 10th trip, uh, trip number 10, The Infinite. I'm kind of hesitating to do that for, for a few reasons. Number one, I'm working on a lot of other stuff right now. I'm a filmmaker and I've quit my corporate, my former corporate job. So I'm trying to find work there. I found some work and I'm behind honestly, and I'm trying to, trying to grind to, to, to get that going so I can bring in some income. But also, uh, more importantly, I have these really deep, broad concepts that, again, I skimmed over uh, on trip number nine that I have to unpack. Like, I have to. Like, I can't just leave it out there. Like, it's, th- these topics are, are too deep and too amazing to to just forget about and, and not do an episode on. So this is my way of saying that, that <laughs> we're going to have another unpacking episode after this. And that kind of, you know, puts us, gosh, probably towards the end of May, right, when, when that one would come out. And, you know, I, I, I'm going to have a, a, basically a month where I'm not going to be able to work on podcast stuff. And that's like, like mid June to mid July. And so what I'm getting at here is it's probably going to be a while before I release trip 10. And the, the other, and probably the most important reason why I'm waiting is because I don't know, I, I hoped to have more followers and stuff by now. And granted, I haven't been uh, helping that I- at all. Uh, I haven't been advertising. I've I made a promo video and I have a website, but what good is a promo video and a website if you don't throw it out there, right? And so it's very hard to throw it out there because everybody, I don't know, um, I- I'm kind of ticking everyone off. The psychedelic crew doesn't like me because I didn't do psychedelics the, the traditional way. Um, you know, I didn't go down to the Amazon to do ayahuasca. Uh, the religious community kind of hates me because I found God through psychedelics. So we're out there. Um, the atheists hate me because I found God, uh, you know, and so the, it's really hard. Oh, and and not to mention again, uh, I'll be blacklisted basically by throwing my name out here like this and leaving a 10, a 15 year career. So it's very hard to advertise this, okay? And not only that, but I, I'm not certain uh, if YouTube, when we were mentioning YouTube at the beginning of the episode, right? I'm not certain that they're going to let me monetize. I mean, uh, I, they've clamped down the rules like crazy. I constantly see things that they have to blur out or bleep out or change the title of on YouTube now because they'll be demonetized if they leave it in. So it's highly likely that once I read a, reach a thousand followers that I won't even be able to monetize <laughs> because of the, the, I mean, we're talking again about a, 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 was it class three or whatever it's called controlled substance. It shouldn't be that by the way, but it is. And so that's the reality I'm facing. So I'm honestly, I'm not in, in, in any real hurry to, to release anything. It's not like I have advertisers breathing down my neck saying, you got to release this on schedule because we have a schedule to meet and you won't get paid until blah. Right. And, uh, and you could argue, you know, well, I should be attracting advertisers, right. By getting a, a larger following, uh, and, and listener base. Well, I don't know. I think I'm a little too late for that. I mean, I'm a couple episodes from the final, uh, uh trip episode, right. I, I doubt that people are going to go retroactively go listen to this, uh, and binge listen and that advertisers will be like, Oh, that's, that's awesome. Here's some money, <laughs> you know, for your old season. <laughs> and, and, and that's the other thing I, I sh- one could argue I shouldn't be in this for money. Um, and, and I totally appreciate and understand that as well. I should be doing this just to help people period. And I get it, but at the same time I have to, uh, survive. <laughs> And yeah, it's tough. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. But anyway, I'm, I'm going to not be in such a hurry uh, to release that episode. And furthermore, I want it to be the most epic thing 
that anyone has ever heard. So I am going to put a lot of time into that to make every freaking second a masterpiece. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully it comes out like that. Uh, so yeah, y'all, that's catching you up on everything. I sorry, I, uh, sorry if I got a little hostile in places there. I truly do love you all, all of you. Like seriously, even the even the negative comments I I, I get, y'all. It, it's this is a journey for me. As I mentioned, I'm a toddler in this realm. Toddlers are prone to temper tantrums. I don't know if you've noticed that. <laughs> um, I'm no different in this thing. Spirituality is brand spanking new to me, and. So please uh, tolerate and just please tolerate me and, and I'm sorry, okay? Every, every person that I meet is an opportunity and I, to, to learn more about myself and about humanity and about existence and about God. And I need to be able to take criticism better. And so if I got a little angry. I apologize, but I really do want this to be something that I can hand to, I don't know, a family member of mine, say, who's about to walk on, walk out on me for the rest of my life and never talk to me again and say, this is why I needed psychedelics. I never would have believed in God otherwise. I was harboring thoughts of half the population of the planet needs to be gone for the planet to be harmonious and back to being good. You know, I don't need to rehash all this, y'all. If you found God without psychedelics and, and someone just walked up to you and said, God is real, or you read it in a Bible or you read it somewhere else or however it, however it was, if someone just tells you this and you believe it, and not only believing, because believing is different than feeling right so you not you not only you don't only understand and believe but you also feel that god is real just by someone telling you this or reading it or even seeing someone's actions who are who is godly and the, and you're like wow you know if you can extrapolate god and feel god through that more power to you god bless you a thousandfold that is a uh, Amazing. I truly do wish that I didn't have to go through the hell that I've gone through in the past um, 39 years of my life to uh, find God, okay? And go through the uh, evil had a stranglehold on me, y'all, like you would not believe okay I was a wreck and so when you tell me that you don't need psychedelics to find God all I gotta say is what do you want from me do you want me to go back to the hell that I was living in because I refuse to do that and if you have a problem with that like I said before wield your wrath upon me make me a martyr please Whew, gosh man i'm sorry <laughs> i lost it again there y'all i'm not implying that i'm some kind of friggin martyr or that i would be one um you know it's i'm just uh, again i'm i'm riled up i need to stop now uh, this episode has gotten out of control. I was going to do a whole different topic and just make this whole thing be the the beginning, the intro. Now I think we're up to like 15, uh, 15, 50, you know, maybe an hour now. Um, yeah. Anyway, I love you all. We'll talk to you all, talk to you all soon. Bye-bye.